Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in Yankee Doodle Dandy. Joan Leslie. Walter Houston. And this is Jean Cagney. Lady Esther and all the stores who bring you Lady Esther face powder and Lady Esther face cream present the Screen Guild Players. Starring James Cagney and Joan Leslie, with Walter Houston, Gene Cagney, Richard Wharf, S.C. Sockhall, and Charles Irwin, in musical highlights from Warner Brothers' forthcoming brilliant motion picture, Yankee Doodle Dandy, based on the 50-year theatrical career of George M. Cohan. <laughs> This is the story of a real Yankee Doodle Dandy, a man who told the world proudly, I am an American. It is the story of George M. Cohan, who loved and understood his country, and through singing his song, that country learned to understand itself. I'm glad to hear people say I understand my country. However, not long ago, I, uh, I created a misunderstanding without meaning to. And it really had me worried. I was impersonating the President of the United States in a play called I'd Rather Be Right when I received a summons to appear at the White House. Well, I was really upset when I walked into the President's office. Well, how's my double? <laughs> I'm not sure, Mr. President. You'll have to give me time to work on that one. Are you sure you'll realize why I sent for you, Mr. Cohan? No, Mr. President, I, I, I don't know I, but if it's because you, uh, you object to my impersonating you on the stage, why... Well, you know, Mr. Cohan, I remember seeing you and your family, the four Cohans, when I was going to school near Boston. Oh, I was a pretty cocky kid in those days. Regular Yankee Doodle Dandy, always in a parade or following one, wherever there was a flag. I hope you haven't outgrown the habit. It's a great quality. Well, I guess I got the idea from my father, Mr. President. He, he ran off to the Civil War at 13. Well, some years after the war, he married my mother and... They toured the variety theaters of the country as Mr. and Mrs. Jerry Cohan, the Irish Darlings. And on the 4th of July, 1878 in Providence, Rhode Island, my father was playing a variety theater alone. Larry O'Leary is my name by trade. I am a dancing master. There's no one can teach the same, nor teach it any faster. It's easy, very easy. If you'll watch every twist, every turn, keep your eyes upon me and surprise you will be at the dancing you have yet to learn. Keep your eyes upon me and surprise you will be at the dancing you have yet to learn. Mother should have been with him on the stage, but she was busy in a smaller production. Father hurried to her as soon as he had finished his turn. But uh, that was once I made an entrance ahead of Father. Are you, are you all right, Nellie? Yes, Jerry. Is, is everything all right? Everything is grand, Jerry. You're the brand new father of a brand new boy. A boy, it is. And born on the 4th of July. Praise be. We'd call him George Washington Cohan. Well... Jerry, but George is fine, but, but the Washington will be too long for billboard. Yeah, that's right. Well, now, how about a good short Irish name? Dennis or Michael. George Michael Cohan. I like that name. Mr. President, 
I was six or seven years old before I realized they weren't celebrating my birthday on the 4th of July. <laughs> I can understand that. In fact, life to me has been a roundup of parades and songs. Often, of course, they went together, but not always. When I wrote Mary, the only parade I had in mind was the one that takes a man and a girl, the girl, down the aisle. And I'll never forget the night my Mary sang the song I'd written for her. My mother's name was Mary. She was so good and true. Because her name was Mary, they called me Mary too. She wasn't gay or like everybody to know that it was written for me, that I'm the Mary. Well, that's easy. How would you like a lifetime job? George M. Cohan's leading lady, one of the play contract, and no option. I think I might like it, Mr. Cohan. Could I uh, be a sample of my part in the script? Well, here's how it starts. How would you like the first reading? Oh, couldn't we have another rehearsal? <laughs> It was Mary, Mary, long before the fashion came, for there is something there that sounds so square. It's a grand I didn't get as quick or effective results every time, though, Mr. President. Another parade I used to lead was the parade of frustrated playwrights marching from one producer to another. I had just about given up hope of ever getting my musical show, Little Johnny Jones, produced when I, I walked into Rector's famous restaurant one night. Uh, Sam Harris was seated at a table talking to another man who didn't appear too interested in the sales talk Sam was giving him. Uh, I didn't know Sam's name then, but I, I'd met him in several producers' offices trying to sell his play, so I knew what he was after. When the villain tells the boy, I'll tell your girl who you really are unless you help me hold up the stage coat. You'll have the audience in the aisle. Sure, just like me, walking out of the theater. I tell you, before I put $10,000 of my wife's money into a show, it's got to have some dances and lots of girls. That was my cue. Schwab wanted songs, dances, and lots of girls, and I had a musical comedy under my arm. So I moved in and told Harris under my breath, Listen, mister, I have a musical. Schwab won't buy your play, but if you help me sell in the musical, we're partners. What do you say? What can I lose? Well, partner, did you sell the musical to Ethan Goff? Well, they're ready to sign the contract as soon as we can get over to their offices. Yeah, come on, then, let's go. But, 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 but for that, did you say something about the musical? Why haven't I heard about it? Oh, you wouldn't be interested. It's nothing but a lot of hit tunes and thousands of girls. <laughs> thousands of girls. <laughs> yeah, and lots of music. I don't mind music under those circumstances. Why ain't I producing it? That's a good question. I will give you my check for $10,000 right now. That's the perfect answer. Let me be the first to congratulate you, Mr. Schwab. Oh, thank you, thank you. You are both very kind to let me in on this. By the way, does our music have a name? It's called Little Johnny Jones. All about Todd Sloan, a famous jockey. Is it? There's a... Give my regards to Broadway... Remember me to Herald Square and tell all the gang at 42nd Street that I will soon be there 
and whisper of how I yearn to mingle with that old time frog. Give my regard to old Broadway and say that I'll be there ere long. We'll give your regard to Broadway. Remember you to Helen Blair. Tell all the gang and boys in Second Street that you will soon be there. To whisper of how you're yearning to mingle with the old time throng. We'll give your regard to old Broadway and say that you'll be there. That was a pretty good tune this day, Mr. President, but my favorite song from Little Johnny Jones was Yankee Doodle Boy. Do you remember? That's all the candy. I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy. I'm glad I am. I'm a real-life Yankee Doodle. Made my name and fame and boodle just as Mr. Doodle did by riding on a pony. I love to listen to the Dixie strain. I long to see the gunner left behind me. That ain't a Josh. She's a Yankee, by gosh. Oh, and you Anything about a Yankee, that's all for me. Little Johnny Jones, a Yankee from the USA. Well, ride the pony, Yankee Doodle, English Derby Day. Johnny broken records every track and every meet. So Yankee Doodle's gonna be the boy they have to beat. Sportsman of the British Isles who follow his career Have offered Johnny anything to keep him over here But all the money in the bank of England couldn't pay Enough to keep young Johnny Jones away from old Broadway If you want to take a tip, the sure is not to blame Have your house mortgage, hock your watches, pawn your rings And put it all on Yankee Doodle, Johnny Jones and I am going to give America the English Derby Cup He's going to give America the English Derby Cup I'm a Yankee Doodle Dandy, Yankee Doodle do or die. A real life nephew of my Uncle Sam, born on the 4th of July. I've got a Yankee Doodle sweetheart, she's my Yankee Doodle joy. Yankee Doodle came to London just to ride the ponies, I am that Yankee Doodle boy. He's a Yankee Doodle Dandy. A Yankee Doodle do or die. A real life nephew of his uncle Sam. Born on the 4th of July. He's got a Yankee Doodle sweetheart. He's a Yankee Doodle joy. Yankee Doodle came to London just to ride the phone. She is a Yankee Doodle boy. Darby are now on the pedal. Take your pick, ladies and gentlemen. Good luck, Johnny. Success to you. All the best of the best to you. We'll make a bet to meet the rest to you. Cause you've got what it takes to win. There they are, going to the post, all in good condition. That Yankee Doodle on the end, a wonderful position. Look at him rear, he's broken line, he's simply wild to run. Now he's back in line again, there's the starting gun. They're off! Come on, Yankee Doodle, we have got to hold the poodle on you. Run, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Yankee takes the lead. Come on, break away, they're showing them how to earn their hay. They're going to run, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. Show a little speed. At the quarter, he's gaining at the turn now, he's reining his horse. Let's go, 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 Yankee, go. The half mark is cruising, but he seems to be losing his lead. Hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. You simply have to win. He'll never win, he'll never win. The other nags are closing in. Down to third from second place. Looks as though he's closing the race. Got him in the pocket, he can't get in the clear. But in the stretch, here they come, he's falling to the rear. Of course, the race is supreme, he'll find out who's to blame. Bear the name of Johnny Jones. That's it, ladies and gentlemen, it's all over. Yankee Doodle let him down. They'll either pasture him in clover or have him hauling rubbish in London town. Goodbye, Johnny. We're through with you. We'll have nothing to do with you. We hear you, fellow. You've been dishonest. And we, the judges, find that you be suspended for throwing the race. 
I am a Yankee Doodle Dandy. <laughs> Yankee Doodle, do or die. Yankee Doodle came to London just to ride the ponies. I am that Yankee Doodle boy. Yankee Doodle came to London just to ride the ponies. He is the Yankee Doodle boy. We will continue in just a moment with the second half of the Lady Esther Screen Guild play, Yankee Doodle Dandy. But first... A brief message from Lady Esther. I am very happy and really quite a bit thrilled to present to the women of America this new Lady Esther program, the Screen Guild Players. Now you know, of course, that you yourselves, you who are listening out there tonight, have made this program possible. For millions of you have chosen Lady Esther face powder and Lady Esther face cream as your favorite aids to beauty. Yes, more lovely women today use Lady Esther face powder than any other kind. And millions of women, busier than they have ever been before in their lives, have chosen my one cream, Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream, for the complete care of their skin. So you see, it has been your own loyalty to Lady Esther Cosmetics that now brings you the leading screen stars and the best directors and writers of Hollywood in this new Lady Esther program. Every Monday night, this new Lady Esther program will bring you your favorite stars in the most popular movies and plays of the year. I hope you are enjoying tonight's presentation, and I hope you will continue to enjoy the Lady Esther Screen Guild plays for a long, long time to come. <laughs> the curtains ready to rise on the second act of Yankee Doodle Dandy, starring James Cagney, Joan Leslie, Walter Houston, and Jean Cagney. Back in the White House office of the President of the United States, where he has been summoned by presidential order, George M. Cohan is nervously continuing the story of his life. Well, Mr. President, uh, little Johnny Jones is a great financial success. And it wasn't long before the four Cohans, mother, father, my sister Josie, and I, were appearing in George Washington, Jr. We all sang the big number in that production, The Grand Old Flag. <laughs> There's a feeling comes a stealing and it set my brain a reeling when I listen to the music of a military band. Any tune like Yankee Doodle simply sets me off my noodle. It's that patriotic something that no one can understand. Melody on Tyree, it's so inspiring. Hurrah, hurrah, we'll join the Jubilee. And that's going some for the Yankee by gum. Red, white, and blue, I am for you. Honest, you're a grand old flag. You're a grand old flag. You're a high-flying flag. And forever in peace may you reign. You're the emblem of the land I love, the home of the free and the brave. Every heart feels true on the red, white, and blue, where there's never a boast or brand. But should old acquaintance be forgot, keep your eye on that grand old flag. You're a grand old flag, you're a high-flying flag, and forever in peace may you Keep your eye on that grand old flag. 
Listen. Listen, that applause, George. Oh, they'd like to. Isn't it wonderful? No. They won't stop, George. Yes? No. Go out and, and thank them. Well, what can I say to that? Well, tell them. Tell them anything. Just so you tell them. Well, uh, you know, thank you. That's all right, but you, you all have to come with me. My mother thanks you. My father thanks you. My sister thanks you. And I thank you. And we're just the beginning, Mr. President. Life from then on was a series of new shows, new theaters, new towns, trains. And all of a sudden, it was 1917. Our enemies of today were our enemies then. We declared war in Germany. Like every other man, I tried to enlist, but he turned me down. As I walked out of the Army doctor's office, one of the fellows standing outside said, Don't worry, pal. We'll take care of them over there. Hmm. Give me an idea. Over there. Hmm. Oh, I keep repeating that phrase to myself. Over there. Over there. Over there. Hmm. It sounded like a, like a great title for a song. And I hurried home to work on it. Okay. Taking up your time with the story of my life? Why do you stop me? Why, I wanted to hear the story of your life. It has a direct bearing on my sending for you. Here. Huh? Do you know what this is? It's a Congressional Medal of Honor, isn't it? Yes. Now, let's see what the inscription says. To George M. Cohan for his contribution to the American spirit. Hmm. I congratulate you, Mr. Cohan. I, uh, uh, are you sure there hasn't been some mistake? <laughs> Quite sure. This medal's only for people who've given their lives to the country. I'm just a song and dance man. Everybody knows that. A man may give his life to his country in many different ways, Mr. Cohan. Your songs were the symbol of the American spirit. Over there was just as powerful a weapon as any cannon, as any battleship we had in the First World War. Mr. President, I, uh, I'm just beginning to earn this medal. Quite a thing. Well, it's the best material we could find, what with priorities and all. Mm -hmm. Well, goodbye, Mr. President. My mother thanks you. My father thanks you. My sister thanks you. And, of course, I thank you. And, uh, don't worry about this country, Mr. President. Where else in the world today could a plain guy like me sit down and talk things over with a head man? Well, that's about as good a definition of America as any I've ever heard. Is there something wrong, Mr. Cohan? Hmm? Oh, God, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the same old trouble. Thought I heard a parade coming down Pennsylvania Avenue. It is a parade. Don't you recognize the music? I ought to. The marching song of 1917 is a marching song of 1942. If I were Hitler, Hirohito, or Mussolini and heard that, I'd take one long look at history and start running. Oh, 
Thank you, James Cagney, Joan Leslie, Walter Houston, Gene Cagney, Richard Worth, S.C. Sockhall, Charles Irwin, and Arthur Gilmore for your contributions to the opening show of our new season with the Lady Esther Screen Guild Players. Our sincere thanks, too, to Warner Brothers for permitting us to begin our season with highlights from Yankee Doodle Dandy, one of the year's greatest pictures, with words and music by George M. Cohan. Two hours of grand movie, which will be playing in your community, a picture which every American must see. And now, the star of our show and the newly elected president of Screen Actors Guild, James Cagney. Ladies and gentlemen, my mother thanks you, my father thanks you, my sister thanks you, and on behalf of George M. Cohan, I thank you. His presence has been strongly felt by all of us here tonight, and we sincerely hope that his story has helped you to understand this great man who, through his songs, has helped our country to understand itself. I'm sure you'll be happy to know that all the benefits derived from this new series of Lady Esther Screen Guild plays go to the maintenance of the Motion Picture Relief Fund's country house for the members of the profession he loved and served so well. Now, as president of the Screen Actors Guild, I would like to extend a warm welcome to Lady Esther, whose sponsorship makes this program, these programs possible. We can assure you that this is going to be a great series, bringing to your loudspeakers the brightest stars in Hollywood in the most successful screen plays. Jack Benny, Robert Taylor, Barbara Stanwyck, Gary Grant, Rosalind Russell, Bing Crosby, Bob Hope, Hedy Lamarr, to name just a few. Next week, for instance, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players will bring you Tyrone Power, Betty Grable, and John Sutton in A Yank in the RAF. And we want you to know that the stars who are contributing their time and services on this program have only one wish. And that wish is the hope that you listeners will enjoy the plays as much as we enjoy the opportunity of bringing them to you. <laughs> will soon be seen in Warner Brothers' Edge of Darkness, and Richard Wharf is now making assignment to Brittany at Metro-Golden-Mayer. Next Monday night, then, same time, same station, Lady Esther will present the Screen Guild players in a yank in the RAF, starring Tyrone Power with Betty Grable, John Sutton, and Pat O'Malley with music by Wilbur Hatch. This is Truman Bradley saying good night for the Screen Guild players and Lady Esther. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild play tonight, A Yank in the RAF. The starring players. This is Tyrone Power. Betty Grable. And John Thornton. <laughs> Lady Esther and all the stores who bring you Lady Esther face powder and Lady Esther face cream present the Screen Guild players. Starring Tyrone Power as Tim Baker, Betty Grable as Carol Brown, John Sutton as Wing Commander Morley, and Pat O'Malley as Pilby in 20th Century Fox's romantic adventure, A Yank in the R.A.F. story begins in 1940, when Tim Baker, a young American pilot, learned he could make a thousand dollars a flight ferrying bombers to England. It was strictly business, so far as Tim was concerned, and business is bad as the curtain rises. Tim is over the Atlantic, and his radio is dead. There isn't any radio beam, sir. I've tried all the frequency bands, and I can't get a whisper out of this set. Well, see if you can get a program from British Broadcasting. When I was flying the mail back in America, I used to always ride in on Kate Smith. Boy, there was a beam for you. 
This is no joking matter, sir. Now, you said it. If we don't land in England, I don't get my thousand bucks. Is that all you're worrying about, sir? Uh, I should say not. I've got a girl waiting for me there, too. She's an entertainer at the Regency House in London. That's nice. Uh, you just don't know. Boy, is she nuts about me. <laughs> Tim, you worm. Why don't you stay away from me? Now, how can you say a thing like that? Here, kiss me. Oh, let me go. Oh, I hate you. Now, that kiss said otherwise, Carol. Besides, nobody could hold a grudge against me for a whole year. I can. What do you mean? I'm the one who ought to be sore. I get back from Dallas and find you've gone to England. And as for that nasty note you left... I'd have rigged up a shotgun pointing at the door if I'd had any string. Listen. Could I help it if I was caught in a snowstorm at Tulsa and had to make a detour? Mm, I know all about that detour. Her name was Irene. Oh, so that's what you thought. I always knew I could clear it up if I could only see you and explain. Explain? That's the best thing you do. But I'm not interested. As far as you and I are concerned, it's over. Understand? Finished? Done. Well, now, that's a fine way to treat a guy who flew all the way across the Atlantic just to see you. What? You flew the Atlantic? The minute I heard you were in England. Well, you must have been awfully well paid. You never did anything like that for love. What do you mean? I've changed, honey. You'll be surprised. Tim Baker, you'll never surprise me again. Just a minute. Surprise? Tim, what are you doing here? Waiting to take you to supper? I mean, what are you doing in that RAF uniform? Just breaking it in for a friend. And uh, who's the friend? Me. Come on, let's see. Didn't I make it clear that I don't want anything to do with you? Well, you don't have to have anything to do with me in a public restaurant. We'll just eat, tip the waiter, and go our separate ways. Now, uh, remember the night we met, Carol, in Kansas City? You were going east. I was going west. We took one look at each other, and then I was going east, too. Oh, that same old Sparks there. Honey, why fight against it? I'm sorry, but I can't risk it again. There's no reason why I should, and I'm not going to. Stop here, driver. Don't bother to get out of him. Oh, I'll just take you to the door. That's all, Cabby. Good night, Tim. Oh, I said I'd see you to your door. You know, I, I like this place. Oh, here, give me the key. Thank you. Now, goodbye, Tim. Well, then, hadn't I better come in and open the windows? I left them open. Well, then, I'd better come in and turn on the heat. You've been turning it on all night, but it isn't going to do you any good. I give up. Here I am. Fly the Atlantic to get near you. Join the RAF to stay near you. Act like a gentleman. Thoughtful, consistent. You're more beautiful than ever. Bye, honey. Yeah. You worm. Well, aren't you going to close the door? Well, Tim, how does it feel to be a pilot in the RAF? Now, ask somebody who knows. What do you mean? They won't trust me with a plane. They've got me going to school. Me? They're going to teach me to fly. But, well, I don't understand. Well, I don't have time to explain it to you now. I'll pick you up backstage after the show tonight and tell you all about it. It's a date. <laughs> I uh, beg your pardon, miss, but I think your car will start better with this in place. Well, what's that? The rotor off your distributor. Oh, did it fall off? Well, not exactly. I took it off. You know the regulation, don't you? Well, I know there's a regulation about taking something or other off your car, but I never could learn what it was. Well, this is it. 
It must be removed to prevent the enemy from using your car in case of invasion. I'll put it back now. There. I thought I'd better take it off so the police wouldn't catch you. Well, that was very thoughtful of you. Yes, if anyone was going to catch you, I wanted to be the one. Oh, do you catch many this way? Oh, I'm afraid I've made a botch of this. At any rate, I don't seem to be getting very far. Well, uh, how far did you expect to get on just one rotor? Well, I was hoping to find out your name, at least. Well, why should you? I don't know yours. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm Wing Commander Morley. How do you do? Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, license number BHX-528. I'll be looking you up. Is this the way to Miss Carol Brown's dressing room? Yes, sir. Uh, shall I announce you? No, thank you. Just a second, Tim. Gosh, Tim, I... Well, Mr. Morley, what are you doing here? Well, I hate to seem persistent, Miss Brown. Well, let's face back. You are. So I am. But now that we have run into each other again, perhaps you'll have supper with me. Well, I'd like to very much, but... Good. But I'm afraid my, uh, my husband wouldn't like it. Oh. Did you say your husband? Yes. Well, I see you're very modern. No wedding ring? Oh. Uh, well, uh, well, that is, we... Uh, because of you... your career, possibly. That's it. Because of my career. That's uh, what I thought. Is your, uh husband calling for you? Oh, yes. He told me he'd meet me here, right after the show. He quite obviously didn't. I'm afraid something detained my husband. Don't apologize. I can wait. Uh, he might have fallen asleep. Quite. Uh, he works all day. He's not lazy then, is he? Well... I guess I'd better run along. I'd be delighted to walk with you. Oh, uh, that won't be necessary. Not necessary, perhaps, but very pleasant. Thanks a lot, and goodbye. Not goodbye. Good night. Shall we say the ivy about one Thursday? What for? Lunch. There's no purpose in it. There's no harm in it either. All right. The ivy at one. Good night. Good night. Hey, who turned those lights? Oh, it's you. I hope I didn't disturb you. Now, listen, honey, I know it's my fault, and I apologize. I'm sorry I stood you up, but I was awful tired. I just came up here and took a nap instead of showing up at the Regency House. It really doesn't matter. Now, don't be that way. At least I wasn't out with anybody else. Really? I was. He was very charming. If I'd known you were here, I'd have asked him in. Oh, so that's it, huh? Trying to make me burn. Not at all. Just bringing you up to date. I'm having lunch with him Thursday. You can have lunch with all the men you want. You're very sure of yourself. Come here. Give me a kiss. Hey, what kind of a kiss is that? Hey, you were out with another guy. I told you I was. With Wing Commander Morley. Wing Commander Morley? Well, what's so shocking about that? Well, nothing. Nothing at all. Wing Commander Morley just happens to be my superior. Mr. Baker, you can say that again. Now, before we hear Act Two of A Yank in the R.A.F., starring Tyrone Power, Betty Grable, and John Sutton, here is a word from Lady Esther. Isn't it thrilling to hear the wonderful things the men in our fighting forces are doing? And doesn't it thrill you, too, when you stop and think that many of the planes our boys are flying, many of the tanks they're driving, and the very guns and shells they're using are made by women? Yes, today, millions of women are doing man-sized jobs. Jobs really vital and important toward winning this war. And they're not looking down on their appearance, either. Just look at their pictures in newspapers and magazines. America's women at war. They're so fresh and lovely that, well, it just does my heart good to look at them. And you know, 
I can't help feeling happy and a little proud to know that Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream is helping so many of these women keep their skin young-looking and attractive. You see, this one cream alone brings them four important aids to beauty. Many of them say it's the only cream they need, the only cream they now use. For Lady Esther Face Cream not only thoroughly cleans their skin, it also softens their skin. It helps nature refine the pores, and it even acts as a perfect base for powder. So if you want your skin to look softer, smoother, and fresher, change to Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. See the wonderful difference in your skin after the very first application. back to a yank in the RAF, starring Tyrone Power as Tim Baker, Betty Grable as Carol Brown, John Sutton as Wing Commander, and Pat O'Malley as Pilby. Adapted for radio by Bill Hampton. Several nights after Carol told Tim that she was lunching with Wing Commander Morley. And on this summer night in 1940, Tim and Morley, together with the rest of the pilots of Bomber Squadron 61, are on a bombing mission over Germany. Take over for a while, Baker. Well, thanks, Morley. Are you sure the Air Ministry can trust me as a pilot? I just finished school, you know, sir. Oh, it's quite all right. I'll keep an eye on you. Oh, thank you, sir. I'll try and do as much for you when we get back, when you're with Carol Brown. Now, just a moment, Baker. I realize you're annoyed because you're in a bomber and not in command of it. Don't you ever think of anyone but yourself? Oh, yes. Sure, on numerous occasions. Sometimes I think of my girl. Sometimes I even think of you when I'm thinking of my girl. And I think how downright ridiculous it is for you to try to cut in on me, sir. from Tim? From the airfield. I'm afraid I'm going to be a little late. Hello. I hope I'm not interrupting anything. Hello? Mr. Morley. What did you say? Uh, I said, uh, how much more time will you need? Oh, 45 minutes on the dot. Okay? Yes, but please, Tim, don't be late this time. Ah, uh, don't worry, baby. I'll be there in 45 minutes. I hope so, Tim. I hope so. Well, under the circumstances, I don't suppose I could interest you in a weekend of my family home down in Kent, could I? No. Tim will be here in 45 minutes. Patty, you better go. Well, all right, but I'll stop back in a couple of hours. Tim might be late. Awfully late. And if he is? Well, I play a fine second fiddle. And there's still that weekend in the country. I can't understand why Carol doesn't answer, Philby. Well, our being six hours late couldn't possibly have made her angry, could it? Oh, of course not. No, I didn't think so. You know, most women love to wait six or eight hours for a date with a man. Especially if it's a dinner date and the girl's hungry. Listen, I haven't been on time for a date with Carol since the first night I met her. She waits. Aye, of course she waits. But where? And with whom? What are you worrying about? She's my girl. Well, she might be my girl sometime. After all, flying bombers can be dangerous occasionally. Your number might come up and I might be left to console her. That is, uh, if I ever meet her. You know, when I think of that poor, innocent little girl going all through life without ever having met me... Hilby, you're a wolf. Not at all. I'm just a faithful old sheepdog. Yeah, well, comb the hair out of your eyes and help me hunt for the key. Maybe she left it under the doormat. She did. Ah, but if she hasn't known, we daren't go in. Daren't we? We're in. Carol? Carol? Uh, she isn't the coy type, is she? What do you mean? 
hiding under the bed. Oh, no. I wonder where she could have gone. Well, Wing Commander Morley disappeared right after we returned from Berlin. You don't suppose... I don't be it... silly. Carol wouldn't go anywhere with Morley when she could wait right here for me. I wonder if you could possibly have any idea what this weekend in Kent has meant to me. Staying in that beautiful old house of your father's. It looks as if it had been there forever. It has, Carol. The first Morley is built it at the time of the Norman Conquest. Back home, I lived in the oldest house in town. It was 32 years old. It must have been a very wonderful house with you in it. Somehow, I prefer this one. It's yours if you want it to be. Marry me, Carol. I can't. Why not? Oh, there's a reason. Wouldn't be Baker, would it? How did you know? The best possible source, the man himself. Well, that's it. I see. Oh, you're the one I ought to love. You're everything that Tim isn't. Then you should marry me at once, by all means. No, I couldn't. Not when I'm not even sure of myself. You'd better drive me back to town. Well, it's about time you came back. Tim, what are you doing in my apartment? We had a date, didn't we? Yes, we had a date. Yesterday. I know. And this time I haven't even got an excuse. It's all right. I was in the country. In Kent. Oh, yeah? Who'd you go with? Friend of mine. Oh, I get it. Your friend, whoever he was, must have been quite a salesman. He did something that would never even occur to you. Something you couldn't even understand. He asked me to marry him. Well, why didn't you say so? If you really want to get married, I'll marry you. You mean you'd make that great sacrifice just for me? Well, why not? I'll, I'll marry you tonight if you want me to. You will? Sure. Well. That's awfully sweet of you, Tim. Your proposal was beautiful, romantic, everything a girl could want it to be. I'm very grateful, but I can't accept. Now, please go. Okay. That's the way you want it. You'll be sorry. The only thing that'll make me sorry is seeing you again. Now, get out! Hello? Miss Brown there, please. Certainly she's here. Miss Morley wants to talk to you. Hello, darling. Carol? Of course I mean it. Oh, this is all very touching. Shut up. What? Not you, darling. Are you coming over? I'd love to, but I can't, Carol. There's a general flap on. All leaves have been canceled. Every flyer's been sent to Dunkirk. Tell Baker to get back to the field immediately. I heard him. Be careful. And hurry back. I'll be waiting. Knowing that, nothing can stop me. Goodbye, dear. Goodbye. Well, Tim, you heard the conversation. I've heard a lot of conversations. That guy can phone you every day in the week. You can call him darling all you want to. But it won't do you a bit of good. You're mine and you're going to stay mine. Come here. Tim, let go of me. You're hurting me. Let go. Hold still now. Not until I put this ring on your finger. Give me that. There you are, my bride. And I'll make it official when I get back from Dunkirk. <laughs> That's Dunkirk, chap. All set. All set, Toby. With you, Roger. Right. We'll break up that nice fat cover your hankles ahead. Here we go. Cover two, take over. Cover two, take over. I'm hit. Over two, taking over, Philby. Follow me, Baker. Sorry, I gotta help Philby. Obey orders, Baker. I can handle this. You cannot. The three heinies dropping on your tail right now. I'm coming in on them. There goes one. Hold tight, Roger. I'm coming in again. Three. 
had me playing second fiddle in a bomber. Great work, Baker. Now get back in formation. Sorry, Toby. But that'll take a bit of doing. I'm not up to it. What's wrong? Baker! Baker! What's wrong, Baker? Nothing, Toby. If I can get out of this cockpit, the hatch is jammed. So long, guys. Here goes nothing. He's right here. It's for you. Thanks. Yes, this is Molly. No word? Or call me back here at Miss Brown's apartment if you hear anything. What did they say? Have you heard anything? Baker's still missing, but they brought in one of the chaps from his squadron. He thought Tim shoot down three planes and get a burst himself. But he thinks there is a chance he might have bailed out. If Tim bailed out, he'll get back. I know it. Why, he's had a hundred forced landings. Nothing ever happens to Tim. Besides, he promised me he'd come back. And this is one promise he has to keep. He said he was going to make this ring official as soon as he got back from Dunkirk. Oh, so that's the way it is. That's the way it is. Always has been and always will be. Yes, speaking. Thanks, old man. In a half hour, they'll be bringing in a boatload of men, Carol. We'd better be there to meet it. Do you think we've missed him? No, they just started coming off. But where is he? There are probably a thousand men on this boat, Carol. I suppose we could have missed him. But you said we saw the first of them. It's easy to overlook someone in a crowd like this. You stay here at this gangplank, and I'll go over nearer the other one. There he is! Tim! Tim! Hello, honey. Are you screaming at me or to me? Oh, Tim. I've missed you so. Didn't I tell you you would? Are you badly hurt, darling? Not too bad. Oh, I knew nothing would happen to you, Tim. Sure you knew it. I told you. I told you something else, too, remember? Yes, Tim. Are you ready to make it official? <laughs> well, I have to. I couldn't get the ring off. Oh, hello, Morley. Congratulations on getting through, Baker. And... Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. What a very lucky man. What about me? Oh, you're luckier than I am. You're getting me. Oh, Tim. I know, honey. I'm a worm. Thank you, Tyrone Tower, Betty Grable, John Sutton, and Pat O'Malley for your grand performances in tonight's play. Our sincere thanks, too, to 20th Century Fox for permitting us to present our radio version of a Yank in the RAF. And now, before Tyrone Power returns to tell you about next week's great show, a word from Lady Esther. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank each of you who has written to tell me how much you like this new Lady Esther program. I'm so happy to be able to bring it to you. And tonight, I'd, I'd also like to thank the millions of women whose loyalty to Lady Esther for Purpose Face Team has helped make this program possible. If I were asked to give one reason why my cream has made so many, many friends, I'd say it was because it's right in tune with these busy times. You see, it takes care of not one, but four important needs of your skin. Every time you use Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream, here's what this one cream does. First, it thoroughly cleans your skin. And by that I mean it even removes the hidden dirt from the mouths of the pores. Second, it softens your skin, really softens it. Removes the dryness and flaking that may cause little lines to form. Third, it helps give the texture of your skin a fresher, lovelier look because it helps nature refine the pores. And fourth, you don't need a powder base because it leaves your skin so soft, so smooth, that powder and makeup look much more flattering. Now that's why I call my cream a four-purpose face cream. It's not just a name. Lady Esther face cream really does all these things. And because it does these four important things, 
you'll see that your skin looks fresher and younger than it has in years. And now, our own power. Today, nearly every one of us is working either directly on a war job or on work that concerns the making of war supplies in some way. Now, one person or a dozen people taking an extra day off doesn't affect production a great deal. But when a few people take a few hours or a few days off merely for pleasure, and that's multiplied by the number of busy plants in America, our war production is cut down. Days lost now may mean added weeks or months of war. Except for necessary rest periods, our fighting men are on the job every day, all day. When we loaf on the job, don't do our part, we're handicapping those men. Our own friends and brothers and husbands and sons. The next time you feel like taking time off merely for pleasure, remember it may cost a man's life because of the work you didn't do. Remember that and stay on your job. As to next week's show, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players have a real treat in store for you. RKO's rollicking romantic comedy, My Favorite Wife, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Robert Taylor and Franklin Pangborn. It's a great show with three of the brightest stars in Hollywood, and I know you'll enjoy every minute of it. soon be seen in the Black Swan. Betty Grable is currently appearing in Springtime in the Rockies. John Sutton will soon be seen in Thunderbird. And Pat O'Malley will soon be seen in Over My Dead Body. All are 20th Century Fox production. Next Monday night then, same time, same station, Lady Esther will present the Screen Guild players in My Favorite Wife, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Robert Taylor, and Franklin Pangborn. The music on this series is arranged and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. This is Truman Bradley saying good night for the Screen Guild players and Lady Esther. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. presents the Screen Guild Players. The Screen Guild play tonight, Pick a Letter, Darling, the Starring Players. This is Rosalind Russell. This is Cary Grant. This is Edward Everett Horton. Lady Esther presents the Screen Guild players in Take a Letter, Darling. All of the stars on these programs donate their services and the money paid by the sponsor for these programs goes directly to the Motion Picture Relief Fund for the maintenance of their country house, caring for the members of the picture industry who are no longer able to provide for themselves. Now, our Screen Guild players present that fast-moving comedy of office romance, Take a Letter, Darling, starring Cary Grant, Rosalind Russell, and Edward Everett Horton. Our play opens in the reception room of Atwater and McGregor, nationally known specialists in advertising campaigns. As the curtain rises, Tom Burney is applying for a job. Good morning. Oh, good morning. I, uh, I have a letter of introduction to A.M. McGregor. Is it about a job? Yeah, the name is Tom Burney. 
And the letter's from Bill Dooley. Well, looking at you, I'll say you'll get the job. Chump. Huh? <laughs> Just a second. McGregor's office. Mr. Tom Verney to see you. He has a letter of introduction from Mr. Dooley. How does he look? Do you want my opinion as an employee or um, as a female? Is there a difference? Oh, definitely. As an employee, I'd say, uh, uh-uh. But as a female... <laughs> well, run him in. I'll take a look at him for myself. McGregor will see you right away. Thanks. Where's the office? Right down the hall. You'll see the name on the door. Come in. Uh, Mr. Verney to see Mr. McGregor. I know. Give me the letter. Uh, huh? I said give me the letter, Barney. Verney. Oh, sorry. My letter's from McGregor, personally. I'm McGregor, personally. Uh, huh? Now give me the letter and sit down. Yes, sir. What was that? Uh, I mean, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Go ahead, Barney. No, no, no. Verney. Well, whatever it is, sit down while I read this. Well, Dooley didn't tell me McGregor was a lady. Is a lady. Oh. <laughs> Oh, did you write this letter? No, no. I heard Dooley dictate it, though. We went to school together. Oh, then you know that you're a very clever lad and that I should be able to find a place for you here. Well, <laughs> I told him to leave the very out. Oh. <laughs> just clever. Yeah, that's just what I told Dooley. For the third time, sit down. Ouch. <laughs> now, have you ever been in advertising before? No. What have you done? Well, uh, nothing. Nothing. Oh, that's quite a career. Uh, look, don't be silly. I had an income. Oh, and now your piggy bank is empty, eh? Yeah, well, you know what taxes do to a piggy bank. College graduate? Yes. Do you want to be in advertising? Well, uh, no. That's a great start. What would you like to do? Well, I guess I'm childish, but uh, that's my secret. Stand up. Can you wear clothes? Well, don't look now if I haven't any on. <laughs> Please, now, will you answer my questions and try not to be cute? Oh, pardon me. Far away. Do you dance? Fairly well. No prizes. Have you any uh, romantic obligations? Uh, no, no. Well, I'll give you a try. The starting salary is $50 a week. Thanks, but what could I possibly do around here that's worth $50 a week? You'll be my private secretary. Sec secretary? I don't know anything about typing or dictation. Oh, we have or, plenty or, of or... girls in the office who are expert at all those things. Your duties will be more personal. Oh, Oh! Well, uh, what do you say? Uh, no. No, no. What? No. Miss McGregor, I've admitted I'm here because I need the money. But if what I'm thinking is right, I'd rather go out and dig a good deep ditch. Mr. Vernick! Oh, you're sweet. In fact, you're positively precious. But believe me, I won't harm you. Well, uh, I just wanted to be sure. Now, before you start, I'd like to have my little say. My last four secretaries went out of here on their ears oh, because their unusual duties gave them illusions of irresistible masculinity. Yeah, yeah. Do you follow me, or are you ahead of me again? Oh, I'm sorry. Now, good. Now, you go to DeJay's the Tailors right away and get yourself a full dress suit. Here's the address. Tails? Tails. Everything. Tell them it's a rush job and to charge it to my account. We're going out tonight. It... Now, you'd oh, better but, hurry. But... Go on, go on. You may have to have alterations. Well, uh, uh... All right, well, wh where will I meet you? Uh, just give me your address. I'll pick you up at your place at 7. Well? well just wanted you to know you needn't bring me a corsage. <laughs> just, just bring me a white gardenia. That won't clash with my tie. <laughs> Goodbye. You'll be ready there at 7. I don't want to wait. <laughs> Well, at least you're prompt. That's something. Here's your gardenia. Oh, 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 oh no. <laughs> Miss McGregor, you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble for unimportant little me. It's worth it. You look lovely. Get in. Well, this must seem a bit unusual to you, Vernie. It does. It is. A woman in business faces many problems, and the greatest problem she faces is men. Oh, I sell advertising to men. The fact that I'm a woman helps, but it also brings complications. Naturally. That's where you come in. 
Tonight you're saving a big advertising account for me by reassuring a jealous wife. Oh, I'm reassuring a jealous wife? We're dining with Mr. and Mrs. French. Mr. Mm -hmm. French is advertising manager of Castle Soups. And you're trying to get the account. And I will get the account if Mrs. French will stop being suspicious of the time her husband spends with me. And the simplest way of reassuring her is to introduce her to my fiancé. Uh, oh, is he going to be there too? <laughs> He's you. Uh... Oh, I get it, yeah. Okay. There's nothing now underhanded about this. No, Mrs. No. French's suspicions are unfounded, and they should be corrected. Yes, yeah, yeah. Well, all I'm supposed to do is act like you belong to me. Yes, mm. of course you love me. But you're confident. Naturally. It isn't every boy has a girl bringing him gardenias. <laughs> now stop it, and don't be coy. Give Mrs. French plenty of flattery and attention, and I'll get the account from Mr. French. Oh, what's the matter? Uh, well, I don't feel honest. I don't even feel like a man. Good evening, Pierre. Ah, good evening, Miss McGregor. Have my guests arrived? Mr. and Mrs. French. Yes, they're seated at your table. This way, please. Hello. Miss McGregor, this is Mrs. French. How do you do? How do you do? May I present my fiancé, Mr. Verney? This is French. How do you do? Oh, oh, did you say your fiancé? Well, how charming. I hoped you'd like him. He's mad about dancing. Aren't you, dear? Oh, certainly. They used to call me Twinkle Toes. <laughs> Would you care to dance, Mrs. French? <laughs> oh, well, if, if Miss McGregor doesn't object. Oh, not at all. Mr. French and I can talk business while we're waiting. You danced divinely, Mr. Verney. Yeah, well, that's because you're so light on my feet. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh I am sorry. Oh, don't apologize. It's a living. Uh, uh, you have a very lovely fiancé, Mr. Verney. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, Max, quite a girl. Don't you ever worry about her? I mean... Spending so many evenings in business conferences with men, uh, like my husband. Oh, go on. What is there to worry about? Mac loves me, and I trust her completely. Especially with as fine a wolf, uh, I mean a man, as your husband. Hey, uh, incidentally, Mr. French is a very lucky man. Oh, really, Mr. Bernie? How do you mean? Well, imagine the trouble he'd have if a woman like you, in the, in the full bloom of maturity, should suddenly decide to spread her wings. Spread my wing. Oh, I'm Mr. Bernie. Oh, well, what a fun. <laughs> yes, isn't it, huh? Oh, no. It positively makes me vibrate. Yeah, well, you're probably just warming up for the takeoff. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bernie, you say the quaintest thing. <laughs> oh, well, you're a great inspiration, Mrs. French. I hope Mr. French appreciates you. Oh, I don't think he does. No, I didn't think he would. <clears throat> But then, what man could, really? Good morning. Good morning, Miss McGregor. Oh, good morning, Jeanette. Has Mr. Atwater come in yet? Yes, Miss McGregor. Oh, well, good. If anyone wants me, I'll be in Mr. Atwater's office. Well, how's the other half of Atwater and McGregor? Terrible, Mike. Just terrible. Well, cheer up. I'll have French's name on the contract before the day's over. I suppose I should be very happy. Ah, oh, that new secretary of mine is a pip. Mrs. French not only isn't jealous of her husband anymore, she's wondering how she can get rid of him. Oh, dear, 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 dear. <laughs> Say, am I boring you? We've just added a brand new million-dollar account to our books. Well, well, really, a whole million, well... Oh, I'm sorry, Mac, really I am, but last night I met a man who, in ten minutes, taught me to hate the world and him and myself. <laughs> He sounds like a bad hangover. Who is he? Jonathan Caldwell, Jr., president of the Caldwell Tobacco Company, and I hope the Reader's Digest tests his cigarettes. <laughs> Boy, last year that was a $5 million account. Yes, and this year it may be even more. Well, forget him. He's not our headache. Justin and Smith have that account tied up for life. <laughs> That's what they think. It just so happens that Mr. Caldwell and his sister, who owns the whole company, are in town now for the sole purpose of changing advertising agencies. Well, what are we waiting for? Where is he? What hotel? It's no use, Mac. I told you I talked to him last night. Well, I haven't. You not only haven't, you won't. Why not? 
Well, right now, Mr. Caldwell is paying alimony to four ex-wives, and it's gone to his brain, if he ever had one. At any rate, he not only hates his four ex-wives, he hates all women. Even his sister? No, he just despises her. <laughs> well, if four women have managed to talk him into matrimony, I should at least be able to talk him into a contract. Now, Mac, you're a more capable woman than I am. Oh, thanks. <laughs> and I am a man. I wish you'd learn to let me finish a sentence. Oh, Sorry, go ahead. There isn't the slightest chance that you or any other woman could sell anything to Caldwell. Why, he hasn't had lipstick on his handkerchief in over a year. Uh, well, not that I have, I mean. Uh, uh, where, where are you going? Oh, where am I going? To study the tobacco business in general and the Caldwell company in particular. I'll be up at my cabin. You going alone? No, I'm taking my new secretary, Vernie. <laughs> Mac, I'm convinced now. There ain't no Santa Claus. What's bothering you, Vernie? What, a secretary on a weekend with a boss and both of us reading? Yeah, yeah. Here are seven years of Caldwell's life in newspaper clippings. Seven years and four wives. I know. Seven years with the wrong woman. <laughs> now he hates every woman he meets. Yeah, and according to the papers, he meets them all. Anyway, I volunteered to get this man-woman-hater's signature on an advertising contract. You'll get it. Why? Why? You're different, that's why. And the minute he finds out you're different, he's hooked. Thanks, but it won't be that simple. Oh, yes, it will. It wouldn't be for most women, but for you, it'll be a cinch. A woman without emotion can plan like a general in battle. Oh, I see. Bernie, tell me, why do you work at a job you don't like? Well, have you ever been to Mexico? What brought that on? Well, uh... There are things down there yelling to be put on canvas, and I think I'm the guy to do it. Oh? How long have you been painting? Ever since I was a kid. Trouble is, I paint what I like. Nine times out of ten, that means no money. Are you good? Oh, I don't know. I haven't decided yet. Anyway, that's why I took this job. As soon as I save enough to buy a jalopy and a trailer, I'm going back to Mexico to paint my head off, live by the sun. Mm. I've dreamt those dreams. They never come true. Well, they will for me someday. Well, I'll tell you something silly. I write poetry. Well, go ahead and laugh. Why? All of us are poets. Some of us can put it in words, and some just get a, a feeling. I like you, Vernie. Well, thanks. Never fall in love with me, will you? I I'd hate to fire you, and... I would if you fell in love with me. Don't worry. Well, why do you say it like that? And I couldn't fall in love with you if I wanted to. And I don't want to. Why not? Because you're a beautiful brain in beautiful clothes. No temperature, no pulse, that's all. I'm a brain with no pulse, eh? I'm a woman, Bernie. More woman than you've ever known. If ever I fall in love, it'll be the sea dashing against rocks. And lightning flashing across the sky. And thunder rolling through mountains. Yeah, I believe you mean it. It's true. Bernie. What are you going to do? Find out for myself. <laughs> yeah, come here. Come on. themselves look just as plain and severe as possible. But today it's so different. Today, in order to be successful in a career, a girl must be feminine and lovely to look at. And she's much too busy and much too clever to be willing to use a lot of preparation she doesn't really need, or to continue with methods that fail to bring results. So that's why so many successful women in business praise Lady Esther for a purpose face cream. You see, they know they can count on this one cream by itself to help keep their skin looking fresh and well cared for. They know that Lady Esther Face Cream brings their skin these four important aids to beauty all in a single jar. Every time you use Lady Esther Face Cream, it thoroughly cleans your skin. It softens your skin. It helps nature refine the pores. And finally... It leaves a smooth, flattering base for powder. Is it any wonder many women write and tell me that Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream alone 
does more for the appearance of their skin, makes it look smoother and fresher than all the preparations they used before. Try it and enjoy the poise and assurance that comes from knowing you look your very best. And now the second act of Take a Letter, Darling, starring Rosalind Russell as McGregor, Cary Grant as Tom Burney, and Edward Everett Horton as Atwater. It's several days after Tom Burney kissed his boss. Instead of firing him, she entrusted him with the important job of landing the Caldwell Tobacco Company's advertising account. Right at this minute, however, she is pacing the floor in her partner's office. You know, Atwater, when I think of Tom Verney lolling around Raleigh, North Carolina, romancing Ethel Caldwell with our money, I could kill him. No, no, no. Calm yourself, Mac. Calm yourself. After all, this was your idea. It was not. It was indeed. You insisted on trying to land the Caldwell Tobacco Company's account. Now, didn't you? That has nothing to do with the it case. It has everything to do with the case. I warned you to stay away from Jonathan Caldwell in the first place. Well, I didn't have any trouble landing Jonathan. Well, perhaps not. But at any rate, when you learned that his sister Ethel controlled the advertising account, you all but screamed for help. I didn't scream. And it was your idea that Bernie fly down to Raleigh with Ethel and sell her that campaign that you had created. Well, it wasn't my idea that he spend his time making love to her. Well, then give the man credit for some initiative. Listen to this newspaper story. Just listen to this. Constant companions at Southern Play Spots are Ethel Caldwell of the fabulously wealthy tobacco company and Thomas Bernie, New York advertising executive... Their whirlwind romance is the talk of Southern society. Well, I think that's wonderful. It sounds as though we're practically certain of getting the Caldwell account. Well, if we have to get it that way, I don't want the account. Oh. Oh, so that's the way the wind blows, McGregor. You're in love with Bernie. I am not. Then why are you worrying about his newspaper romance with Ethel Caldwell? Well, I... I'm I'm just tired of his ignoring my instructions. Uh, I see. No, you don't. He hasn't answered a wire in two weeks. Well, I might point out that you haven't answered one of Jonathan Caldwell's phone calls in two weeks either. That's different. Naturally. My wife to Tom were about business. Caldwell's trying to give me a romantic sales talk. No. Yes. You mean that that four times loser wants a fifth wife? That seems to be the idea. Oh. Oh, and I suppose that after Bernie marries Ethel Caldwell and you marry Jonathan, I won't be even a junior partner in this organization. Now, don't worry about that. I'm not marrying Jonathan, and Vernie isn't going to marry Ethel. Just how do you propose to stop him? I'm going down to Raleigh and straighten Mr. Vernie out myself. (laughs) And then I'm going to fire him. (laughs) Hello? Yes. Yes, she is. She's here, yes. It's for you, Max. All well. Tell him I'm out. I can't. I told him you were here. (laughs) Oh, all right. Hello? We're going to meet you right away, McGregor. No place. I'm taking the next train for Raleigh. Oh, that's... Perfect. I'll go with you. And forget about a hotel reservation because you'll stay with us at Caldwell Acres. Your man Bernie's there with my sister Ethel. Well, thank you very much. Now, what was on your mind? Well, I'll tell you about that when I get you on my home grounds with magnolias and moonlight to help me. I'll take a chance on anything, even becoming Mrs. Caldwell number five. If I can get down to Raleigh and get my hands on Tom Bernie. Say, are you in love with Bernie? What? Of course not. I hate him. Why? Oh, nothing, but I'm warning you, I want you myself. And I'm going to do everything I can to make you continue to hate Bernie. Hello, Caldwell. Glad to see you. Hello, Bernie. I'm sorry Ethel and I were out riding when you and Mac arrived at Caldwell Acres. Yeah, it's just as well. I was anxious to talk to you before McGregor did anyway. Hey, uh, by the way, where is Mac? Now, up in her room, pouting. Coming down the train, I found out that she's really jealous of you and my charming sister. Oh, yeah? Well, it's about time. Ethel and I have been working hard enough at trying to make her jealous. Well, you've succeeded. The self-sufficient McGregor is just about ready to fall in your arms if. What do you mean, if? If you don't weaken. It isn't enough just to make McGregor jealous. No? Well, what would you suggest? Go on, you've had four wives. You should have learned something about a woman. Well, now that you know Max jealous, don't let up. Oh, oh, really pour it on her, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. (laughs) I get it. Make her think I'm really in love with Ethel, huh? Yeah. (laughs) Announce your engagement. Make yourself obnoxious. (laughs) Hey, do you think I could? (laughs) Without half trying. (laughs) Could you imagine her trying to hold out against me? With you coaching me? (laughs) 
I don't know why you should spend so much time worrying about Bernie McGregor. He's enjoying himself somewhere with Ethel. I'm not worrying about Bernie. I'm worrying about the Caldwell Tobacco Company's advertising account. Well, you certainly don't need to worry about that. Why not? Well, when Bernie marries Ethel, he'll control the account. When, Ver- when Bernie I'm... marries Ethel? Who said he was going to marry her? Why, Bernie told me so himself. When? Oh, this afternoon when you were up in your room resting. He said he hoped you wouldn't be jealous enough to do anything foolish, but uh, he had to look out for himself. Bernie said that? Those were his exact words. Why, that egomaniac. Why should I be jealous of him? Why should I care what he does? Well, that's exactly what I told him, Mag. Bernie doesn't mean anything to me. He was just my stooge. And not a very good stooge at that. I hope I never see him again. I'll tell him so, too. Oh, he'll just laugh and tell you not to be jealous. Jealous? Me jealous of Tom Bernie. I'll prove to him that I'm not jealous. Well, that's a great idea if you can do it. I can do it. You asked me to marry you, didn't you, Caldwell? Is the proposal still in effect? It most certainly is. Then I accept your proposal. That ought to prove to Mr. Verney that I'm not jealous of him. Good night. Who is it? Me, Tom. Go away. But I've got something important to talk over with you. Well, I don't have anything to discuss with you. Oh, yes, you do. Colbert just told me you'd agree to marry him. Well, why shouldn't I? Well, being jealous of me couldn't have driven you that far. Jealous of you? Do you think the fact that you are marrying Ethel Caldwell could have the slightest influence on my accepting Jonathan's proposal? I'm not marrying Ethel. You are, too. I am not. You sent me down here on business, and I've done everything you asked me to do. I didn't ask you to marry Ethel. Neither did Ethel. (laughs) Ethel's only interest in me was in getting a good advertising campaign. Well, you got it for her. Your pictures have been in every gossip column in the country. They have not. Jimmy Fiddler's mad at me. Anyway, I'm talking business. Tonight, Ethel okayed the campaign layouts and signed the contracts. Here it is. Thanks. Now, I've just earned that $10,000 bonus you promised me for landing this deal, and I'm quitting. Effective as of right now. Quitting? Where are you going? To Mexico, if you must know, in a trailer. But you can't leave me now. Can't I? Well, don't let my dust get in your eyes. Are you going alone? Certainly I'm going alone. Oh. And just to show you how stupid a man can be, I'll tell you something. I honestly believed once that you'd be making this trip with me. Me painting. And you writing your poetry. Did you mean that? Yeah. It was so real that you stubbed your toe while I was taking you through the Aztec ruin. I did? Yeah. I was a fine chump. You couldn't even love Caldwell. (laughs) Of course I don't love Caldwell. You don't love anything but yourself and money. Well, you're going to have more money than you ever dreamed of, Mrs. Caldwell the Fifth. You planned your life with nice, cold-blooded perfection and accomplished everything you set out to do. You're a fine, money-grubbing machine. So that's all you think of me? That's all I think of you. As I told you once before, you're a beautiful brain in beautiful clothes. No temperature, no pulse, and that's all. Is that so? Yeah. Well, as long as we're reminiscing, I gave you the answer to that once before, too. I told you then I'm more woman than you've ever known. It's true. If I weren't, I wouldn't have lost my head and told Colwell I marry him just to spite you. What? I told you that love could only happen to me once. And you, you were that one. I've always known that if I ever fell in love, it it would be the sea dashing against rocks. Lightning flashing Flashing across across the the sky sky and thunder thunder rolling rolling through through the the mountain. Well? Huh? That's your cue. Come on, Tom. Turn on the thunder and lightning. Thank you, Rosalind Russell, Perry Grant, Edward Everett Burton, and Paul Stewart for your superb performances in tonight's play. Miss Russell, we enjoyed every minute of it. Thank you, Mr. Bradley. It was our fun. We'd like to express our thanks to Paramount Pictures, too, for permitting us to present our radio version of Take a Letter, Darling, adapted by Bill Hampton. Cary Grant has something exciting to tell you about next week's show. But first, 
I'd like to have you hear a word from one of America's foremost beauty experts, Lady Esther. Thank you, Miss Russell. Today, all over America, busy women who once used as many as three and even four different kinds of preparations for their skin are now changing to just one cream, Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream. And so many of them say that this one cream by itself does more for the appearance of their skin, makes it look smoother and fresher, makes it look younger than all the preparations they've used before. Now, here's why this is true. Lady Esther Face Cream brings your skin four important aids to beauty every time you put it on your face. First, it thoroughly cleans your skin, removes even the stubborn dirt from the mouths of the pores. Second, it softens your skin and relieves the dryness that may cause little lines. Third, it gives the texture of your skin a fresher, lovelier look because it helps nature refine the pores. And finally, you don't even need a special powder base anymore because Lady Esther Face Cream leaves your skin so soft and smooth that powder and makeup look more flattering than ever. So you see, smart women today waste no time on beauty preparations they no longer need. All they use to get these wonderful results is my one scientific face cream. Try it and see for yourself why more and more busy, lovely women every day are changing to Lady Esther Four Purpose Face Cream for the complete care of their skin. Ladies and gentlemen, Cary Grant. <laughs> Next week, the Lady Esther Screen Guild players have a great dramatic treat for you. The tender and moving story of a lovable English school teacher. Goodbye, Mr. Chips. You will hear Mr. Basil Rathbone as Mr. Chips and Miss Merle Oberon as Mrs. Chips. I know you'll find it grand entertainment. Thank you, and good night. Next week, then, Merle Oberon and Basil Rathbone will appear in Metro Golden Mayor's Goodbye, Mr. Chips. The Screen Guild players are presented by Lady Esther from Hollywood. This is Truman Bradley saying thank you and good night. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.